24-year-old Yoshinobu Yamamoto of the Oryx Buffaloes and 21-year-old Roki Sasaki of the Lotte Marines are indisputably the two best pitchers in Japan right now. Yamamoto is the two-time defending Pacific League MVP, the two-time defending Triple Crown winner, and the two-time defending Sawamura Award winner, given to the best pitcher in Nippon Professional Baseball. No pitcher has ever won three straight MVPs, Triple Crowns, or Sawamuras, so any of these accomplishments in isolation would be unprecedented, but having the chance to three-peat all these achievements in tandem is truly unthinkable. We haven't seen dominance quite like this since Yu Darvish and Masahiro Tanaka were in their primes, and this is likely Yamamoto's final year in MPB before being posted to MLB, so obviously he wants to go out with a bang. But there's just one problem. The young phenom Roki Sasaki stands in his way. On April 10th, 2022, at just 20 years old, Sasaki set the world record for most consecutive strikeouts in a game with 13 before throwing a 19 strikeout perfect game in what is possibly the greatest pitching performance in the history of baseball. Then, without missing a beat, he threw eight more perfect innings with 14 strikeouts in his very next start. He wasn't able to complete back-to-back -back perfect games because he got pulled due to his high pitch count, but with a flaming fastball that sits at 99 miles per hour and regularly touches 102, plus a wipeout forkball, it was clear that Sasaki, nicknamed the monster of the Reiwa era, was well on his way to becoming one of the best pitchers in the world, not just Japan. He started to fatigue a bit in the second half of the season, and didn't throw enough innings to qualify for the leaderboards, so Yamamoto cruised his way to take home every meaningful pitching title, but the question everyone had going into the 2023 season was if Yamamoto could hold off his rival Sasaki for another year, or if the monster would be fully unleashed and surpass him as Japan's number one pitcher. Before the regular season, however, the two Pacific League rivals became teammates on the Japanese national team for the World Baseball Classic. There was never any bad blood between these two in the first place, but the WBC really made them close friends as they visited Miami before the tournament and filmed an Amazon Prime special documentary together. For now, Yamamoto has the status of Ace of Samurai Japan, but both pitchers were instrumental in Japan's undefeated run to become world champions. In the semi-finals against Mexico, Yamamoto piggybacked on Sasaki as the two formed a devastating 1-2 punch into the late innings. Neither of them pitched quite as well as they would have liked, but they kept Japan in the game and ultimately enabled the comeback victory. After the dust settled from the WBC, Yamamoto and Sasaki returned to their respective MPB teams and got ready for the regular season. They weren't quite ready on opening day, but they both made their season debuts on April 7th and absolutely dominated as Yamamoto tossed six shutout innings, allowing just two hits and striking out six, while Sasaki gave up one hit across six scoreless frames, punching out 11 batters. And most importantly, the fact that they debuted on the same day meant that they were lined up to go head-to-head -head the following week on April 14th when Sasaki's Marines hosted Yamamoto's Buffaloes. Before any major media outlets picked up this story, I eagerly tweeted out the potential for a Yamamoto vs. Sasaki matchup over a week in advance and grabbed tickets to the game because there was absolutely no way I was going to miss out on this. Last year, the Buffaloes adjusted their rotation on a couple of occasions to purposely dodge a Yamamoto vs. Sasaki matchup, but it seemed like this time fate was on our side and it was indeed confirmed to be happening. For the first time ever, the ace of Samurai Japan, coming off a year in which he threw his first career no-hitter and successfully defended his MVP Triple Crown and Sawamura Award, was up against the monster of Reiwa, coming off a year in which he threw 17 consecutive perfect innings. This was going to be a true heavyweight title fight, Goliath vs. Goliath. Very rarely do we see the two best pitchers in a league go head-to-head -head quite like this. The only modern MPB comp you could make is Yu Darvish vs. Masahiro Tanaka from over a decade ago. Those two generational talents dominated the league for years and went head-to-head -head four times with Darvish going 2-1 with one no decision and Tanaka going 1-3. But considering that Japan just won the WBC, drawing a lot of new fans to MPB, and that Yamamoto is going to MLB next year, 
I don't think we've really had a battle of this magnitude in the middle of April, maybe ever. But don't take my word for it, here's Mr. International Baseball himself talking about the significance of this matchup. What's up y'all, this is Sean Spradling. Um, the significance of the Yamamoto Sasaki matchup honestly cannot be overstated. This is one of the best pitching matchups in the entire world, in world baseball of 2023. We've been waiting for this matchup for a long time. They both played on Samurai Japan, teammates in the WBC, both absolutely dominant, two of the best pitchers in the whole world. Um, honestly, pretty unprecedented. Like the only thing I could really compare it to is like if we went back to 2014 and had like Pete Clinton Kershaw, MVP winner, multiple Cy Youngs, um, the best consensus pitcher in all of baseball versus uh, like the, the potential of Steven Strasburg at the time best pitching prospect of all time, like insane stuff, over 100 mile per hour. Like if you had those guys match up at the time, that's kind of the hype that I think this would have compared to because this was pretty hyped up and it lived up to that. Like people were watching that in the US. Um, I woke up at 3 a.m. in Colorado to watch it, paid five bucks to get access to it. So easily one of the best pitching matchups in all of baseball um, and it lived up to the billing. Thank you so much, Sean. Now we finally get to the actual game itself. Friday night, April 14th, Zozo Marine Stadium in Makahari, and it's sold out with over 30,000 fans. To put this into context, Marine's night games in April are typically only about half full, the weather isn't the nicest, and the stadium isn't in the most accessible location. Yet, on this particular cool evening, it was absolutely packed. Gaijin Baseball was in town, so I met him in person for the first time, and we had an awesome night chatting about baseball while watching this historic matchup. And man, the game did not disappoint. Roki Sasaki opened the game by striking out the side in absolutely dominant fashion on 12 pitches, and he continued to ride that momentum through the early innings, recording two more punch-outs in the second, and Shogo Nakamura made a nice play on the only batted ball against Sasaki thus far. But he didn't just stop there, as he got two more strikeouts in the third before striking out the side again in the fourth. So after four innings, Sasaki was perfect, having not allowed a single base runner, and he had struck out 10 of the 12 batters faced. This was beginning to look reminiscent of his perfect game almost exactly a year ago, when he set the world record with 13 consecutive strikeouts. As for Yamamoto, he was also dealing in the early going. Shogo Nakamura and Izanori Yasuda were able to shoot balls past Yumamune at third base for a pair of doubles, and Yamamoto was hanging his curveball a bit, but overall he was in cruise control as he struck out the side in the third and opened the fourth with another K. But that's when the Marines finally got to Yamamoto as Koki Yamaguchi and Hisanori Yasuda hit back-to-back -back singles to put runners on the corners with one out. Gregory Polanco popped out though, so it appeared as though Yamamoto would escape the jam, but then Kenta Chatani hit a grounder that bounced off Mooney's glove just past the reach of Marwin Gonzalez at short, to give the Marines the lead, and that was all Sasaki would ever need. He finally gave up some contact in the fifth inning, but still didn't allow a base runner until the sixth when he walked Masahiro Nishino to open the inning. Then Kenya Wakasuki squared to bunt, but pulled back to swing and dumped a fork ball into center field for the Buffaloes' first hit of the night. Ryo Ota dropped a bunt to move the runners along, but Sasaki was not about to relinquish this lead, as he struck out Tokumasa Chano in a big spot, then got Gonzalez to fly out. Inning over, no damage done. I thought that would be it for Sasaki's night because he had already thrown more pitches than in his first start, but the Marines sent him back out there for the seventh, where he surrendered another leadoff walk, but then got a double play and a ground out to finish his night. Meanwhile, Yamamoto ended up pitching six innings himself, allowing just that one run in the fourth. The Marines would add on with an insurance run against Soichiro Yamazaki in the seventh, and Hirokazu Sawamura would shut the door in style with his first MPB save since 2020, and that was that. Yoshinobu Yamamoto pitched very well, going six innings on five hits, one earned run, one walk, nine strikeouts, and he even had 37 called strikes plus whiffs. He got unlucky with some batted balls, finding holes, but it was a quality start and one that made him deserving of a win. Unfortunately, when you're going up against the monster of Reiwa, you need to be next to perfect, and Yamamoto was just outdueled by his frenemy, Sasaki, who had a final line of 7 innings, 1 hit, no runs, 2 walks, and 11 strikeouts. This is nothing new for Roki, but it's just as mind-blowing 
every time he does it. He topped out at 101 miles per hour and had 14 called strikes plus 25 swinging strikes in this game, giving him a total of 39 called strikes plus whiffs. It's amazing that Sasaki is doing all of this with mostly two pitches, his flaming fastball and wipeout forkball. Now, he has been throwing in that slider a bit more often that Yu Darvish helped him develop during the WBC, but he doesn't really use that as a swing and miss weapon. He just uses it every once in a while to try to steal a strike. His bread and butter is still the fastball fork combo. He typically uses the fastball to ambush hitters and quickly win the count, then he puts them away with the fork ball, which is pretty much unhittable when you're trying to time up 100 miles per hour. Yamamoto was also sitting around 95-96 this game, so he is obviously no slouch, but those extra few miles per hour on Sasaki just make him feel inhuman as he would go on to throw 7 more shutout innings in his next start, giving him 20 scoreless innings to open the year. Yamamoto, on the other hand, would run into a brick wall, going up against one of the hottest pitchers in Japan right now, Kona Takahashi, and took the loss. So, we don't know when or if the next Yamamoto Sasaki matchup will happen. There is a potential rematch coming up on April 28th, but it seems like the Buffaloes have adjusted their rotation to where Yamamoto will not pitch against Sasaki. So, whether this was just round one or this was the only round we're ever going to see in the story of Yamamoto versus Sasaki, I think we can all agree. Both these pitchers are prodigious, and it was an absolute honor for me to watch both of them. Special thanks to my patrons. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.